Welcome to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages, with your host, Matthew Schiff. This is the podcast for all of those who are involved in the agriculture all the way to the distribution of beverages. And now your host, Matthew Shipp. Hello and welcome to Harvest of Poor. I'm your host, Matthew Shipp, and today I am here with Patrick Matashashki and Kaibab Savage, the co-owners of Savage Savage Spectrum Estate Winery in Palisade, Colorado. How are you guys doing? Doing great. How about yourself? Excellent. Yeah, thanks Man. for having us, Matthew. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you being on the show today. So you guys are out in Colorado, your your winery. Tell us a little about yourself, how and how you guys met each other, and kind of take us through that story of our spectrum, how it became, what what it is, what it is. Kai Bab, do you want to fill them in, maybe a little bit about the grapes, because I feel like that's where the origination started. Yeah, so we've okay. both been in the Colorado wine business for quite a while. I've been in it 24 years. Patrick's been in it closer to 10, and we started... I had started as a commercial grower, so I was growing grapes and selling to other wineries, and we still continue that. We work with, you know, 20 plus different wineries throughout the state. And that's where I met Patrick was at, you know, one of these other wineries and they were sourcing our fruit and we got to know each other. And then we just, you know, he, he continued, well, you can tell your part. Yeah. So I was working for other commercial wineries, like he said, and you know, I was exposed to, to the vineyards here in Palisade, really just my boss at the time said, come on out. We're going to show you how to sample grapes and just running through the vineyards here, picking berries off the vines, sending them out to ETS. But yeah, one day it was super rainy, very muddy. And we got a little mini Cooper stuck in the back over here. And Kaibab, you know, caught us out there and took us back to his house and made us hot chocolate. And the rest is history. <laughs> oh, that's, that's cool. And that's, that's so if you wouldn't truth. have got stuck in the mud. This never would have happened, huh? Pretty much. But, but yeah, truthfully, these vines here are really all I've known and grown up. But, you know, I've, we've sourced with other companies from other vineyards, but I, I've grown up with these wines. So for me, that's a really important part of this story. Okay. And so when you guys, so when did you guys come together and decide to make just go from the vineyard to the vineyard and the winery. So 2019, we, we started, well, just a little earlier than that, we started chatting about getting, you know, the reality of what it would take to get it going. Cause it's a lot to put, you know, a winery together from scratch. We, we didn't have a building, we had nothing. And so we started chatting about the idea. We were both on board. You know, I think Patrick was ready for that next step in his career, of really just, you know, having complete creative control in the, in the winery, I think he, you know, had a real vision for these unique grapes that we're growing and how to express them, you know, and, and really highlight what they're capable of. So Pat Patrick, what was your vision for the winery? At the, I'll you start. Know, you know, I would say it started even before that, like it was about 2017. I remember standing in this vineyard over here called Snow Vineyard and you know, talking with Kaibab and he's like, man, I've got, I've got these really awesome grapes. They, they have great acidity. You know, they just, they're not the best selling grapes. I, I wonder what could be done with it. And I think at, at that time we both also enjoyed sparkling wine. So I can remember very early on, I'm just thinking in that vineyard, like, how can I get a tank? I just need one tank. And then, you know, push comes to shove. We, we kept talking about it and really, I mean, Kaibab had the idea on his own. He's like, I got, I've got to start a winery because, you know, sometimes I have these really banner years where we need to do something with the fruit. So as he said, I, I was ready for the next step in my career, really enjoy being creative. You know, I'm unhirable. I want to do what I want to do. So <laughs> It's, it was just, it was time, you know, I was working at a corporation that I didn't quite enjoy, you know, the money was good and stuff. So we're just excited to take that next step. That's awesome. Where did you, was it your idea to take it, the, the grapes and go sparkling that later on? Co collaborative, you know, that's, very early. that's, yeah, yeah, that's why we, we started this whole, this whole project is so in 2017, Standing in that vineyard, Kaibab, I think, gifted me 
in another company I'd worked for about a half ton. And we, we actually piloted this R and D batch, you know, elsewhere, sold it under their brand and it, it was a hit. And so what we did is, is what I did is take that information, you know, from that R and D batch and we, we kind of dialed it in and we, we changed the processes. So come, you know, 2019, when we were ready to open the doors, we, we kind of knew what we were doing. So we've really been working towards this goal. You know, to start, we had a, a, a brute. We had one that was a little bit off dry um, and that even grew into a sparkling red. So we were, we really had the vision very early on. 2019, we opened the doors with Sparklet and quickly adding more and more. We figured, yeah, let's make some red wines. Let's make some white wines. And it was really Kaibab who would always come to the winery and say, hey, man, there's this challenge. We have these grapes. What can we do with these? And, and that's why our company has been very successful because we're not copying the neighbor. You know, of course, you know, we pay attention to tradition, but we're utilizing lesser known grapes and we're not afraid you know, to, to create this blend that's not traditional. And I feel like the, the younger demographic is, is really interested in that. Yeah, that's, that's, I really like that, which you're, you're taking different varietals of grapes and seeing what you can do with them. Was the grapes that led you to being sparkling or is that just where you wanted to start with? And then you've just figured out how to incorporate the different varietals into sparkling wines. So, I mean, what I think we've really embraced is you can't force a wine or a grape to be something it doesn't want to be. And so these, these varieties Patrick's talking about, we planted, we planted them into response of, of the weather conditions here in Colorado. These are very hardy, robust varieties, but not well known. And so it was, it was challenging to get sales because people weren't familiar with them. And so I think what Patrick really did was figure out what the grapes wanted to be. And these definitely want to be sparkling. The numbers are just beautiful for sparkling and, and, the, and the acidity and just the, how they're, they come out. They have so much fruit, yet so much acidity. You can just get this amazing fruit forward, sparkling wine. No, that's really, now they are a heartier wine. Does that give them a higher sugar content with the acidity or, or what is, what, what enables that, that grape to be that way? So they take the winners better. Their, um, their okay. buds will actually take lower temperatures, like a, traditional mm -hmm. European grape variety about its threshold fully acclimated is like negative five. And then it, the buds down. Wow, that's great. And so these, some of these, some of these are crazy. Some of these are polar bears. They'll take like negative 30. It's, it's, wow. it's insane. There's a, we work with a, a private breeder, uh, Tom Plocker. Some of his stuff is just amazing. He's, he's creating these varieties, new varieties, American varieties that, that really oh, thrive in, in, you know, our, our different conditions that we have. Okay. Now, some of the, I know some of the first varieties, I'm getting a little off subject here. I guess, I guess the Nortons eventually is, is that a, a backbone of that or is this something completely new? These are new. The, a lot of this, a lot of like Tom Plockers at least is coming out of Lewis Wenson's breeding program out in Minnesota. And, and okay. so oh, wow. Norton is, is one, it, it's an older one that I think, yeah. But no, these are, these are, these are novel. There's, there's this Vitis genus program of these different breeders. Cause there's universities, Cornell and uh, university of Minnesota, mm -hmm. and, and they could actually use the, you know, science to kind of speed up the breeding process. The breeding process can take traditional breeding. Oh, yeah. It's 30 years. It's if they mm -hmm. shorten it to like, they can get new varieties in 10 now. It's pretty crazy. I used to do some of that. I was a molecular plant biologist in a past life. And cool. so, and most of, funny enough, a lot of my varieties I worked with were cold weather. I worked with sugar beets yeah. and I worked with a, a cousin of canola and working on some biodiesel and some other things. So yeah, I totally, in Minnesota, I actually had test beds up there. So that. <laughs> yeah. You're very home. familiar with that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they're using like PCR. So, you know, they have the, the, yep. the genome sequenced and they're able to yep. build different traits. It's crazy. Oh yeah. Yeah. The PCR, they've got different ways they can incorporate those genes now. It's just really neat. Getting back to the wine, <laughs> what were some of your open challenges you guys had? Well, just really, you said you were starting to build this. You, you were just starting from scratch. What were your, your biggest early challenges getting this going? 
I mean, yeah, for me, at least it was finding a spot to build it. So we, we had to take out vineyard and put up the building. And then we had to put together a winery on a, on a very bootstrapped budget. <laughs> so we sort okay. pretty much everything in the, in the, you know, aftermarket from different wine regions. You know, we have tanks from Texas, our presses from Oregon. It's, you know, we just kind of started looking for what we needed and putting, putting the pieces together. Patrick, yeah. anything to add to that? Yeah, to add to that, it's of course buying classified site unseen. You know, sometimes there's some, you know, problems that arise there. So working through those, but all in all, you know, we've got a pretty sweet deal over here. You know, it, it is kind of like a, a very big garage operation. We got the floor drains where we want them, but it's, it, we, we still have enough room to, to grow a little bit here in certain regards. But besides that, I would say for the business, COVID, obviously, COVID mm, was, yeah. was the biggest challenge that we worked through. And there, there are some pros and cons to that. Oh, really? So take us through some of the pros. Well, the pros, believe it or not, we're here in Western Colorado. So it's an area, high desert, right before you hit Utah. And uh, it, it's a wine region, but unbeknownst to us, because COVID canceled everyone's travel plans, your, your trip to Bermuda or what have you, Mexico, everyone jumped in the car three hours, three, four hours, you know, from Denver and really explored their backyard again in their, their agriculture, agricultural area. Oh, they came, yeah. they came out. Yeah. Jump in. Kevin. Oh yeah. You just cut up for a second. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. So, you know, at first it, it was, we had just opened and there was no business in there. Like you can do curbside and we're like, we don't have any customers. Like we do, we have, we have to meet some people first. And, and then it kind of opened up a little more. And I think, I think Mesa County was very progressive in there. They had a five-star variance. And if you followed all the rules, you could open back up. And, and we did. And we had a, we have a big crush pad. We built it to make wine, but we found out people love to hang out out there. Like it's a big covered patio. So, you know, we have like a 3000 square foot patio, which was perfect for COVID. Like we, yeah, you know, yeah. everybody could space out. And so we, we saw a huge bump from that. Like Patrick was saying, people traveling here and really finding wine country in their backyard that a lot of them didn't even know were here. And, and then pleased with what they found, the quality and the experience and coming back and telling their friends. Wow. It's really interesting that COVID instead of wiped so many people off the map, this one actually helped really stabilize you guys on the map. And I imagine there was a lot of uh, nice state and national parks around you guys. <laughs> and that adding on to that backyard feel, bringing in that's, that's, that's great. Uh, it was good. There, there was, I just want to add, there was, it was really good timing as well. You know, there was Colorado wine. It was really making some new strides um, that I, and Kabe could really speak on that because he's seen it for so long, but new blood in the industry, you know, better wines, better education. So the last time people had tried Colorado wines, you know, maybe they were, sweet or you know maybe they they got unlucky and had a bad wine you know there's good and bad wines so you got to sort through them but we just we were starting to really hit our stride when all the visitation started happening the volume really picked up yeah what i what i really saw in the industry haven't been in it in quite a while a lot of people who had wineries here you know came from somewhere else where they made money and they they started a winery as a lifestyle and a lot of what the shift we're seeing are people that this is their life. They've grown up in it. That's all they've ever done. And it's, they're very passionate and enthusiastic and, and talented. And they're, they're just doing some really cool progressive things. It's, it's just a really fun time in the industry to be part of it. And like, be, you know, on the, on the cusp of that. Well, I'm going to want you to talk about some of those new things they're doing as we kind of move into our harvest to poor journey. So I, as a, as a coin of the podcast is harvest to poor. The harvest, again, is sourcing your material, how you either you grow it yourself, you source it someplace else. What is important about that? And, and in your case, what or changes are you seeing in this Colorado wine industry that are, that's, you believe, making these businesses more relatable to new palates and the, and then also making your wine uniquely yours? There's, 
you know, craft brewing, there's specialty roasters, and there's also unique ver- varieties of wine. How do you make it yours and how do you make it stand out? And standing out kind of takes us into the poor. How do you get, you, you sir, how do you turn this into a service? How have people recognize your wine, appreciate wine, want to come back for more? So I'm going to step back. That's a long question. I'm going to step back and let's start in the, into the harvest. I am very interested. It's great that I have a, a vineyard grower with us today. And what are you seeing right now in the industry? And what are you seeing? What are you excited to, to get to play with here pretty soon? So, yeah, it's something I've always really enjoyed is, is growing new grape varieties and really trying to figure out the best varieties that fit our climate for Colorado. And, and we, we, we grow over 30 varieties, which is kind of a crazy number, about 60 acres of wine grapes. But what I'm seeing is, is kind of the trend is kind of this higher alpine varieties, more similar, you know, we're, we're high elevation, but we're still hot. So we're not like cool climate, like Pinot's, we still get the temperature to ripen these varieties. And so we just need to look to areas for inspiration, more similar like us. So like the Alto Adagi region in Italy, Toraldigo, we're having a lot of success with Toraldigo if you're familiar with that one. It's a, it's a big red, great food friendly wine. Gruner Veltliner coming out of Austria. That one's been really cool for us as well. Pinot Meunier is coming online. That'll go into like a classic, classic sparkling wine. It's one of the three champagne grapes that are in champagne. So that's, that's going to be really cool. And, and what I like about the, the Pinot Meunier is it's the most hardy of the three grapes. So it, like even in France, that's where they plant in the cooler area, colder areas. That's, that's so, so is, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. So is this, are these, some of these finding their way into that breeding program you were talking about? So these are just, you can call them obscure varieties. They're European, but people mm-hmm. just aren't familiar with them. So another okay. one like Zweigel coming out of Austria, it's their number one red. Zweigel or Veltliner is their number one white. So, so we're playing with those, but then we have the, the you know, these, these, these cold hardy varieties as well. We're, we're playing with Vignole, Aramella, Petite Pearl, Verona are some of the names that you'll hear. Okay. And what's, what's important to you when you're sourcing these grapes for your wines? So what's cool about what we do is we're hundred percent estate. That means all the grapes that we make into wine, we grow. So they're all coming from our farm, which okay. gives us, you know, control from grape to glass. We have a tremendous amount of control along the way. And so for us, we had, we just, we have to do our job in the vineyard and, and make sure we're delivering the best grapes possible to the winery. And at that point you hand it over to Patrick and, you know, needs then, then it's up to him to get it to the bottle. And how important is the land management for these, cult, these more hardier grapes? I know some can be really, I mean, I, I like a, a really dry rosé from, from France. You can almost like, it's very earthy and very, so I don't know how, how much the soil influences your, your, your grapes. Yeah. What do, what do you see in Patrick and the wine? You kn- when I talk to my other friends that are winemakers, we're, we're really astounded by the minerality that we can, that comes through in the wine. And we find that due to the caveat, you could really touch on the soil competition here, but we essentially have some volcanic rock, some kind of pumice rock in this soil. And we attribute it to that. That's, that's kind of the, the main thing we really find in the whites and there, there's more about the red, but can we touch on that soil real quick? Yeah. It's, it's pretty what we have going on. So we're, most of our soils are pretty alluvial. We have kind of three main soil. A lot of it's washed off the book cliffs and then it's intermixed with, depending on the site, some sites have sandstone, big sandstone strata and other sites have like basaltic lava. Those kind of very well drained. We find those to be the best for the reds just because we can really control those vines and their growth. And then we have uh, kind of this more clay, gyp rock, clay loam, kind of reddish soil with basaltic lava as well. And then we have the valley floor, which is like decomposed ancient seabed. And we're growing a lot of our cold hardy stuff over there on those soils. And so we're really trying to pick, match the site to the grape variety and what will really excel. And then the farming practices are slightly different on each soil because they have different water holding capacities. And so we're, we're looking at irrigation 
and, and the nutrient requirements, some of the, that, that decomposed seabed has, is a lot richer soils and those, a lot of those farms have been in alfalfa or grass hay forever. So they have tons of organic matter. So we're, we're just trying to balance all these, all these parts to the equation. That's neat. You really, really got a unique playground to experiment with your, your grape and your growing techniques, even not only just the varieties. That's, 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 that's very exciting. It keeps it interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Patrick, once you get Kaiba, get you the sources, your, your grapes for you, you get this wine. How do you start making it uniquely yours? I would say, you know, we want to be inspired, you know, and calculated in, in what we're doing and really showcase the quality of, of the grapes, of the fruit. So, you know, there's a lot of time at night reading, what should we do with these grapes? And a lot of times we're looking to, you know, an area that's been dealing with them for years and years. So for instance, what we found with these American cold hardy grapes, I, I felt inspired by, you know, what some of the natural winemakers were doing in the South of France, you know, since the fifties or even prior to that. And, you know, really just letting the grape be what it wants to be. You know, we're not over here heavy handed, you know, throwing oak to, to hide flavors that are developed in the vineyard because we are an estate winery. So really the focus is always on, you know, how can we coax the fruit out of these grapes? Okay. Have, have you, you said you weren't, you're not doing much to add to it. Do you have a, is your, is your process any different than anybody else's or? What do you, yeah. how do you, you say you just state, you want to make this your, 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 your estate, your, your claim, your unique wine. Yeah. And we have so much going on. We have so many different brands, you know, pretty much the company are, our, our pet nets. If you're familiar with like Petalant Naturel wine, they're bottled under a really cool label, you know, with like a bus on a rainbow, kind of like a comical label, but basically that line of wines, we don't touch, you know, it's what comes in is what ends up in the bottle. So ironically, they're taking on, you know, flavors that almost don't taste like grapes. They almost taste more like sour beer. And that's, that's just the nature of that. When we're really trying to showcase our, our finer high end estate fruits, you know, we might, you know, be using smaller amounts of sulfite and, and what have you, a little bit of oak to possibly tie up some pyrazines, but we're just really trying to be balanced and inspired and just not be heavy handed where we're going to, you know, hide the flavors. And that's how we're going to coax out our estate flavor profile and, and really the flavor profile being developed from untraditional blends, rare, obscure varietal bottlings. I think that's kind of our, our signature as far as the flavor. So what are some of the challenges you're running into, running into obscure wines? There's no, there's no real playbook for these, for these new varietals or obscure ones. So do you run into any challenges on the way? Yeah. I mean, I think it, in the vineyard, you know, we see, see some stuff or like, oh, wasn't expecting that, you know, right. same thing. In the vineyard, just real quick with these, these, most of these, at least the cold hardy varieties, what's really cool is they're pretty grower friendly. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for disease resistance and things like that. So you could, you'd actually back off on, on some of your cultural practices and, and be a little more, you know, sustainable in the vineyard. That's cool. Yeah. Go, okay. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah. There's, there's always challenges no matter what we're doing here. I mean, especially with, we talk about it all the time, you know, invited to like our annual seminars when we're talking about American cold hardies, it, it, they're just not reacting the same way your typical vitis vinifera acts. Challenges we deal with are, you know, maybe a little bit of global warming, might you say. It's it's heating up here. So we're seeing increased pHs, you know, across the board. So just really trying to change our practices in the winery. You know, maybe when we bring something in, bring it in a little bit earlier, lower pH, it's going to allow us to use less sulfites. I, I don't know. We could, we could go on quite a while. Um, there's <laughs> oh, just... it's, it's, I, I, like I said, science background, I geek out on the process and the science here. So this is kind of partially what this is about, is identifying challenges so other people can learn from your challenges and your mistakes and your successes. And, and so, I, yeah. that actually, 
Some, yeah. Something that we do as well as the fermentation technique, like we find like certain varieties like Verona really benefit from like a carbonic maceration type fermentation versus a traditional fermentation. Okay. And so, yeah, really figuring out how to work with each one of those varieties, like Vignol, very low yields in the press. It has this thick pulpy skin that doesn't want to give up its juice. And so just Patrick's had to play with different pressing techniques to get our juice yields up, you know, out of those grapes. So you have multiple, multiple pipelines per, per variety of grape, or is it, you can kind of match and mix and match. I mean, there's di different vineyards for that same varietal. Is, is that kind of what you mean or? Well, you just said the, the different characteristics. Can you, which if, if you have different process, different pipe, so you have different pipelines for what you're producing with well, one with the thicker skin, one with the not so Absolutely. thick skin, maybe higher sugar. Yeah, yeah, no, I, every little thing we bring in, we treat it differently. You know, okay. my experience, I've, I have worked for like corporate wineries that, you know, maybe it's easier to treat everything the same. And in mm -hmm. my opinion, at the end of the day, they start tasting the same. Right. So I'm very, you know, careful to not fall, fall into that. You know, we really want to coax out, you know, maybe Vignoles has a, a pineapple note. So tons of research and development, you know, in, in the nights before receiving it, you know, before placing our harvest order is, is how can we make the best vignoles and, and what does that taste like? So just trying to coax out some of those flavors, whether it's the yeast, you know, it's, it's the skin contact, you know, how long are we going to leave it in the press? It's, there's just so many variables in the harvest as you know. Yeah. 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 It's, I, it, I, and I like, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. I like the problem solving in that, that just, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I mean, you're just not thinking over. That's really gets you excited. Keeps you on your toes. It's taking the time to really break down each aspect and, and to really look at every li little step of the process to try to mm -hmm. figure out how you can make the best wine. That's that's my opinion. And and starting with the best fruit, and, and that's definitely keeps it interesting for sure. Kai, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, it's. It's pretty amazing the number of wines we have going, like what Patrick and our, our, our assistant winemaker are working on. You know, there's, there can be 30 completely different styles of wines from sparkling to natural wines to big red wines. We do a bourbon barrel wine. It's just, it's kind of crazy to look at all of the, like the balls in the air at once and to see them all come together. I mean, consistently, like I'm just blown away. Like when I come in and try these new, like I just. We knew for this year's a Gamay. You did carbonic on that, right? So we did. Yeah, we took a single lot at, and picked it two different times. 50% was done, you know, Burgundian, where it was, you know, destemmed and punched down. The other 50% was wrapped up for carbonic maceration and flooded gas. So, I mean, that's just an experiment right there. But yes, we did cool. partial, partial car carbonic. Oh, it's funny on my side. I spend so much time in the vineyards. I don't always know what's going on in the winery. And so I'll just go in and look around and find barrels. And I saw the gamay and I'm like, oh, cool. I want to try this. And it was great. It came out really good. Well, that's, that's awesome. This is a great segue into the pour. You were talking about the unique flavors, unique taste, how more of the, the corporate wineries kind of keep it easy and they have the same thing. They, they, they have their consistency. You have your uniqueness and, and people who want to have something different than, than your your normal off the shelf wine. How do you, uh, for the poor, how do you inform people about who you are, get them out there, taste them and keep them coming back? I mean, mostly what we do is, is very gorilla, no matter, you know, how we get to the, to the end, we, we do it ourselves more or less. We have a distributor, but we're out there using social media really as much as we can. You know, we're running Google ads. We're actually throwing in festivals on our own and also attending festivals, you know, the good old fashioned way, just, just get your product out there, start mm -hmm. tasting it, showing up at accounts, ride alongs with the distributor or just showing up on our own, you know, cause we, cause we drove by, you know, Hey, let's go, let's go stop in see if they sold any wine, that kind of thing. Okay, you have anything? 
you're growing out. Are you distributing beyond the borders yet or are you still within just Colorado? We've done a little bit in California, Texas, and it hasn't been like crazy reorder or anything, but yeah, it's out there. We're, we're really focused, I would say, on, you know, winning our, our home territory. There's quite a bit of competition out here more and more, especially, you know, just in our town. So try, <laughs> trying to be focused that, you know, everyone that comes to Western Colorado or Palisade is going to come to Savoy Spectrum. That's really important. And I look forward for it. I'll, go ahead. I would add, we, we offer a different experience that I think a lot of people really enjoy. It's, it's kind of this industrial laid back vibe. And, and so it's not, people just feel comfortable in our space. I, I hear it all the time with our guests. They just really feel comfortable and then they have a good experience and they like the wines and they talk about us. You know, word of mouth is huge. And just getting that is, is, is a big win. And then we do run farmer's markets as well. We're at like four different farmer's markets throughout the state, had a lot of success there. And then we also have a, a remote tasting room in a small mining town, Uray, Colorado. So we're part of cool. another community too, or we're, we're kind of the ambassadors of the Colorado wine industry in that regard, in that area, it's in the Padre Valley and we're like two more hours down the road is wine country, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty cool. No, that's neat. Well, I, I look forward to your wine coming to Missouri. Um, so we, yeah, we have our own wineries and wines out here, but it's it's always good just to see different different Lots influences coming through. through. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Emerson, uh, Norton's. Mm -hmm. We have a really good. I interviewed them a while back. Noble Ice is doing great things with the Norton's and turning them into sangrias. It turned into the can sangrias. That now the, I think Major League Soccer is actually purchasing for the local soccer team out here. It's it's wow. kind of a neat story. That's a, so yeah. And then you got some really cool stuff going on too. And that. so that takes me to another piece. What is your current biggest challenge right now? All this stuff, you've got your harvest, you've got the creation and you've got the marketing. What's your biggest open challenge currently? I, I personally think it's, it's with, you know, sales because what we're seeing is that the wine sales are slightly dipping, giving way to whiskey really non-alcoholic is I, I look at that as the biggest challenge for sure Even and on the on the national scale is is been on the downturn a little bit and we're bucking the trend we had sales growth but we're working really hard to get there mm -hmm. i mean it's a tremendous oh, yeah. amount of work for seven percent but like we're, <laughs> we're making it work you're, yeah you're right there with the coffee shops i think they're sitting at seven or eight if you're doing well so Right. That's great. We're constantly oh. being told, you know, through winebusiness.com or, you know, the rest of the industry publications that, you know, we're not catering to the up and coming demographic. And, you know, that's constantly what our, awesome. what our eye has been on is, is how do we, mm -hmm. you know, cater to this generation? How do we sell them wine? But also what I've, I, I think I realized in the past couple of weeks is, you know, we don't want to disregard the baby boomer because they are, you know, one of our, our biggest customers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're really trying to create wines and maybe not the exact same wine that appeal to different demographics. Who, you know, we still have those, mm -hmm. those big reds, those traditional style ones, but then we have like the pet nats for the more natural younger wine drinkers are our sparklet, which is more of like a classic sparkling wine, you know, kind of you would see at weddings or no brunches or, you know, so really it's just have all these different, you know, we have, we truly have something for everyone. When you come in, we have a, yeah. a dry hopped pet nap. So it's more like a beer. It's, it's, it's cool. Wow. I was going to mention that sour, as you said, it's almost like a, almost like a sour beer. That's definitely something the new, the new drinking generation is is interested in. Mm -hmm. Those fruit and sours and such. So yeah, I I think you you even mentioned Patrick too that you're you're you are attracting that younger palate. Yeah, I think you have to, of course, you know, without scaring away the baby boomer. But new challenge. We're just we're just trying, you know, is the best we can. We're very diversified as far as our portfolio. When you come in here, it, it looks more like a brewery almost, kind of like a small batch brewery. And, and some of our bottlings like the pet nets show that because why, why do we just have to have a traditional, you know, wine label with a chateau on it? 
you know, it doesn't appeal to the younger demographic in my opinion. So, so we're really, you know, trying to explore different designs in, in the graphic design department for our label. We're just, we're trying, man. We're trying every sales avenue that we know, trying at every whatever to, to get people yeah. in the that's, I mean, you definitely, I really like the, the innovation towards these unique ideas and kind of not just keeping it traditional, but bending the trend enough and experimenting with new ideas, new flavors. It's still wine in the end. It's just what the wine gives you. That's, that's, I really think that this is great. So taking on that, where do you want to take your business next? Where do you see yourself in, where do you want to be in the next, I don't know, 12 to 18 months? 12 to 18 months, just, you know, busy, or, super busy. That's okay. So, so the code we need to crack here on Western Colorado is, is how do you make your winters busy? So how, I mean, okay. it would be awesome, right? In 12 to eight months to have a tasting room in Vail. I don't think that's exactly attainable for us, but we need to figure out how to generate more cash flow and more revenue during the winter. So I think that's a bigger problem just here with our community, period. But yeah, just okay. generating more sales, bringing more people in, busier locations, maximizing each location we have, adding food to, to get people to stay longer. Ah, so you, you have not added food yet to your location. We do a lot of yeah, food we're, trucks on the weekends. Oh, yeah. So we're kind mm -hmm. of rotating menu of food trucks, but yeah, we would like to set up something permanent. Just it, it just okay. adds that extra element for the guest. Okay. Well, that's great. I, that does, these are uh, actually really, that was a nice, clear challenge statement you had, Patrick. I appreciate that. Most people can't come up with them like that. And that's, that's, you're right on top of what you tell oh, your open challenges. That's a, that's a great, that's a great thing. What would you tell a entrepreneur, somebody who wants to do what you guys are doing, start from scratch? What, what would you tell them from what you've learned already? Just keep going until you're successful. That's, no. that's okay. the only option. Yeah. Well, Fair or, enough. I mean, I would ask them, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> right. You have a pretty good job right now. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's all, it's yeah. all trade-offs, right? Working for yourself was great, but you're also responsible for your own revenue. So that, that, that okay. part yeah. would be a little, you know, scary. Yeah, there, was, okay. So sort of the, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. All right. All right. That's, that's cool. And so real quick here, we're getting near the end and I just wanted to ask a quick question and this one can stump some people. Some people have it right down. What is, I got two of you now. So what's your favorite beverage within the winery and what is your favorite bit, uh, beverage when you're not drinking wine? I'd say sparkling, like just right on the gate. My go-to is like sparklet white. It's just so versatile, easy drinking, fruit forward. Definitely. And then outside, probably like margaritas. Those are pretty good. Margaritas. All right. What about you, Patrick? For me, I really enjoy a product we have. It's called Cero and it's a Blanc, a Zinfandel. So it's a Zinfandel picked early, almost like a sparkling wine. And although it never went through that process, so it really retains its acidity. We put it through neutral French oak. And we actually hit it with Chardonnay leaves. So it aged excessively on mm -hmm. um, leaves from Chardonnay. So you get some of those kind of autolytic brioche notes. And again, it it's almost tastes like a flat sparkling wine. Really unique. That's probably my favorite wine that we do. And I also like tequila pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Agave it's, spirit. It's good. Good. All right. That is awesome. You guys have any events coming up or anything you'd like to talk about in the next, coming up in the next couple of months or anything you have this seasonal? De yes. Definitely. Oh, go ahead, Patrick. I would just, I'll kick off the first one. You know, we actually have it coming up here in the next week or so, February 17th, your Ray Winter Wine Fest. It's a collaboration between us, Elevation Weddings and Events, really great wedding planner, party planner. And then the historic Wright Opera House in Uray, Colorado. It's one of those, you know, historic masker buildings. So it's got that iron facade, just beautiful, beautiful yeah. venue. And uh, we throw a wine fest there. Very small, very curated boutique, 
we do it every year. So come February around this time, the next year it's, it should be there as well. Bring in curated food vendors, kind of artisans that are, are doing their craft live in front of you. And it's just a really upscale wine spirits involved also event. Yeah. Okay. That's one. Anything else coming up? Yeah, that's that's a really fun one that's coming up right around the corner. We do another festival here in, in Palisade. First week of May this year, it's May 4th. It's called Sip into Spring. And Patrick touched on this earlier, but we really wanted to take the wine festivals back from the organizers. The highlight of the wine festival is the wineries, yet like we have to pay to be there. And, you know, so so we just started organizing our own festivals. And Sip into Spring was the First one we did coming right, coming right out of COVID, we saw they were lifting restrictions. And so we wanted to have like the very first festival right when the COVID ended and, and, and we did, and we launched the SIP in the spring and it's been sold out for the past four years. And so it's, it's a great event right on the river, Orchard River View. Hmm. Very similar format so, to what Patrick's talking about with Dure. You know, we bring these curated vendors. We have these live arts, we have great food. It's just a, it's a live music all day. It's just a really, people really enjoy it. Really laid back, casual event. It's small enough, intimate enough. You get to, you know, chat with the winemakers, the growers, the artisans. Mm. Sounds like I need to come out there and get some more people on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So you said it was May the 4th? Yes. So you're, you're going to have like a really, really dark red, have a little bit of a Star Wars theme to it. Yes. Just thrown out it, there. May the fourth be with you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> Our dark, dark red, dark, the dark side red. Oh, Anyways, I like that. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, good, all good ideas here. We love creativity. You got to absolutely throw it out there and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, is, so those are some, do you, have, you have anything else? Do you have anything through the summer? So yeah, we're launching what we're, we're calling the bubbles brunch this summer. So starting in May, every Saturday, we'll have a DJ and a food truck and really pushing the brunch aspect so people can come in and, you know, pick up food, have their mimosas. So that'll start in May and go through September, I believe. So every Saturday at the okay. in Palisade. That sounds great. Sounds great. So guys, this has really been a cool story all the way from, you know, it may have never happened if somebody didn't get stuck in the mud all the way to the unique soils and the varieties that you're bringing in. And Patrick gets to play with all this and problem solve for all this, which I, I don't know if you're, I'd be geeking out on that too. That is, that is a great thing. Just to be able to play with all these flavors and all these ideas. And so I really encourage anybody who's out this out on Palisade, please check, check out, um, Check out the winery. Check out what they have. I'm, I'm sure by the time somebody gets there, it's going to be something new. I love the idea that you have these sours coming out, much like beers. And it's just the, this really cool the beverage industry has this neat blend of, it's almost like coming together right now. You were talking about, was it carbonic maceration? I know they're even using that for coffees now when they keep the cherries on, but fruit forward coffees. You guys are, and that's something that Hawaiian's been doing for a long time, but just all your different practices. And I really wish you guys luck. Really curious about how things will go to your, your, your open challenge of getting the winter wine scene going. I, I, I like this idea. So, you guys, this has been a great, great interview. I really appreciate it. And I hope to run into you guys and hope to see some, some of that wine out here in Missouri, too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having Thank us now. All right. Talk That's to you awesome. later. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Harvest of Poor, the business of beverages with Matthew Shep. Check the show notes for our guest contact information and connect with Matthew Shep on LinkedIn today.